Welcome to episode number 141 of the Chris Rose Rotation, a production of John Boy Media and presented to you by our friends over at SeatGeek. And look who's back. He looks he looks so old now that he's 30, Austin Hedges, because he's falling apart at the seams. When I saw him last night, he slides into the dugout and pops eight hamstrings. You okay? I'm good. I'm good. I'm not as I'm not as limber as I used to be. Uh, didn't feel real good, but we're good. We're good. I think we I think we got away with something that wasn't terrible. Um, it's, I'm, I've had a few sprained ankles in my career, and it's just another one of them. It'll be fine. Okay, good. Because my 16 year old son Brady, whom you met yesterday, looked at me and goes, "Oh my God, we jinxed him." I said, "No, no, no. This would have happened regardless, right? We didn't jinx you, did we?" What did we say? Nothing. Just that we saw you. Oh, that you saw me. No, that that's you probably did jinx me then. Okay. All right. I, so it, uh, that makes more sense. So seeing you yesterday, it is your fault. Oh yeah, let's watch it. That's cool. Look at how athletic I look. And then see ya, Dad. Yeah. It was a smooth move. You know, I actually went on social media to figure out. I went on Twitter to find out what was wrong with you because we couldn't tell, obviously. We didn't have a broadcast. We were at the game. And there you are sliding in the dugout. We thought it could be anything. Somebody, <laughs> you're going to laugh at this. Somebody wrote on social media, I think he mouthed the words, he popped his asshole. And I said, <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, What? <laughs> I said that guy Pretty is close. obviously not John Boy. He's not. A Dude, I know they need to go. They need to reach out to John Boy because. Uh, but I don't know. Like I mean, it is. It sounds like something I would say. Like I don't know. Maybe you're 30. You get a little old. Maybe I don't know. Maybe I. Maybe I did pop my asshole. I need a men's diaper now. I don't know how this goes. How do how do old people function, Chris? Why are you asking me that, Austin? I mean, have you looked at your beard lately? I've got. I've darkened it a little bit. You try have. to you stay in the game. Handsome. I'm sorry. You look super handsome. Um, yeah, I don't know if that really happens or doesn't happen or I, 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 I'm not privy to it. Let's talk about better things like your 30th birthday. What'd you do? Uh, we didn't do a whole lot. Me and uh, my wife and Cal Quantrill and his wife went and saw a comedy show. Good one. Good comedy show. Yes. Steve Byrne, uh, another local guy from um, uh, Cleveland before him. They were outstanding. <laughs> just said the meanest things you could ever say about the audience and the world. And that's my favorite type of humor. Did they pick on you? Sadly, they did at the end. <laughs> I got called up on stage at the end. I was like, I thought, I thought these guys were messing with me. I'm like, okay, of course you guys made this happen. This guy's picking out. He said, his show's done. He's like, all right, I need like five people to come up on stage. He's picking and he picks at me. I'm like, oh boy. I'm wearing my fanny pack. I don't know if everybody knows this, but I'm a big fanny pack guy for, I think it looks hot, first of all. But mm -hmm. second of all, convenience is number one. So I'm always wearing my fanny pack. I get up on stage and look down, I'm like, all the times, like, this is like the most perfect material for this guy. Luckily, he didn't really mention anything of it. But the thing that he made us have to do was he brought a woman on stage who he'd been absolutely wearing out all, all show. She was in the front row. And this lady, I promise you will never sit front row at a comedy event ever again. So he has her come up on stage and like five random dudes now have to like dance on her. I'm like, oh my God, dude, what am I going to do? He's like, all right, everybody, like, here we go. And luckily for me, I just watched a really good movie, which I highly recommend. It's called Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. It's pretty out there, really good message, wild, funny, dark. Really, really cool. Recommend it. Anyways, one of the main guys in the movie has a fanny pack and he starts using it as like freaking nunchucks. He's beating the crap out of everybody. And he's doing all this stuff. And I literally watched that the night before. I looked down at my fanny pack. I'm like, okay, I have a prop. I'm not going to go embarrass myself in front of all these people. And they had already introduced me as a guardian. So I'm like, all right, everybody knows now. So I take the fanny pack off and swing it around, put it around her. It ended up being a nice little prop. Well, it sounds like you found a nice little side business. Oh, I can stripper dance. I'm not a good dancer, but I can stripper dance. Really? I can I can drop it low. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it's all that crouching you've done over the years. It is. It is. I can get into that stance very, very comfortably and just stay there. Can't Most wait for you. Most people try and go back up. I just drop down and then I'm done. That's it. I, 
may I suggest bringing a pole out to home plate and perhaps in between batters or something, entertain the crowd. I'm going to need, what is it? Does a cane count? Can I just bring a cane now that I'm, I'm like 85 years old and just dance on it too? Yeah, I think you're one of three guardians over the age of 30 now. I am. I am. My counterpart and our old man, grandpa in the bullpen, Brian Shaw. That away. Well, you're, I know you're really looking forward to uh, your trip back out west to your homestead, to the return of the land of San Diego, the place where you started, and the Rose family will be following you out there. It's like we're stalking you a little bit. Yeah. Uh, what time do we have to get there on Tuesday to uh, see the entire Hedges parade? Uh, it's on Monday, on the off day. It's from like 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. It was the only way that the whole city could go because there's like a few hundred thousand people that are coming for the return. Uh, I got your tickets. Uh, you can come on the float if you want. It's going to be it's going to be great. Yeah, I'll get you on the float. We'll say hi to everybody. Solid like 14 hours. Then we'll play some baseball. Are you excited? I'm really excited. I am. I am. Uh, I've been looking forward to this one. I love playing there. Uh, I mean, it's one of the best places to play. It'll be my last big league field. I uh, will be in the visiting dugout. Oh, that's cute. Yeah. What do you, what do you expect the reception to be? It's, it's a, it's, it's a good question. Cause I, I've thought about it obviously a lot and I try not to have any expectations because I have no idea. I, they're like, it's, it's, it's such a different group now too. You know, it's, I mean, so many coaches from the, from front office to coaches, to players, like there's really, I got my boy, Will Myers there. And then it's like, I mean, going back to when I was there from 2011 to 2020, it's such, it's such a new look. Um, you know, uh, I just, you know, I'll have enough people that I want to see. And then hopefully, hopefully I gave the fans enough of, uh, enough of something every now and then to, to not get booed too loud. I don't think you'll get booed. I hope not, but you know, it is, it is what it is. And everyone has their, their opinions, but uh, regardless, I know I'm going to have a good time. Okay. Like, should we get to Austin Nola ahead of time and just make sure that he walks out of front of home plate like Yachty does when pool holes comes back or when Matt Carpenter just went back so that, you know, you get your just due and you can tip your cap and, you know, wave to everybody. I think what's going to, I, part of me wants it to like not go well. And like, it's like, I'm getting booed and like, no one really cares. And then like I, on my own call time and just give myself like a five minute tip of the cap while no one's reacting. I feel like that would be good. Well, I'm going to tell you this. We have very good seats on Tuesday night. We are going to be yelling at the top of our lungs for you. So when you hear, hey, Hedgy, yes, you know that's the Rose family. Our one, okay? our one, my one group. That's all I need. Perfect. I, ha I have to be honest with you, though. I cannot call you Hedgehog. That's just not appropriate. That's not. you. The, 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 the former of that word, the first part, is that how you say it? The first part of that word is just it's, it's not part of my name. Have you seen my catcher's gear? What does it say? What does it say? It says hog. For good reason. Are we really going to go down this road? You brought it up. But you have hog on your chest. I know. It's my nickname. Who gave you that nickname? Me. You. <laughs> <laughs> you gave yourself a nickname? I gave myself a nickname. I, uh, there's not many self-proclaimed nicknames in this league that have stuck, but mine has at least, it did in San Diego, it has in Cleveland. And then if you put it on your catcher's gear, then people are like, hey, Hog, what's up? And I think Hog sends out the message to the world to think about me the way I want them to think about me. The problem is that when people, if they were to ever Google that nickname, your likeness would not come up. Uh, and that is exactly why it's the perfect nickname. <laughs> I just need you to think, or if you Google it, I already won. I won. If you took your time out of your day to Google it, then I, I, 
That's all I need. I just want you thinking. Are there people that don't get it when they come up and they see it says hog on there? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then I have to feel out if you have a sense of humor or if you don't. And then I have my two answers. And what are they? You don't have a sense of humor. It's like, oh, a hedgehog. You know, just, you know, hedgehog. Everyone's seen that. So it's just hog. You know, I'm kind of a dirty guy every now and then. It's weird. But uh, if you have a sense of humor, it's just like, oh, I don't know. It's just shower talk with the boys. You know, we take a lot of showers together. Just pat yourself on the back, bro. Edgy. Hey, more of the Rose Rotation coming your way. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about CSG. is an expert and impartial third-party authentication and grading service for sports cards. And we know how big the sports cards business has. It's really circled around. People are making a ton of dough. Now, after grading, sports cards are encapsulated in archival, durable, and crystal clear CSG holders that protect and preserve. In fact, every CSG certified sports card is backed by the CSG guarantee of authenticity and grade, which is the strongest in the industry. Collectors know that they can buy and sell with peace of mind when a card is in a CSG holder because its authenticity and condition are guaranteed. CSG consistently has the best turnaround times and pricing among the leading third-party sports card grading services. And I want you to save some dough. Promo code gets you 15 bucks off yearly memberships. The offer does expire September 30th of 2022. So grade your sports cards with CSG. Get $15 off yearly memberships with the promo code ROSE at csgcards.com. Oh, boy. Uh, it has been a remarkable ride for you guys. Um, we've talked about it several times that, uh, you know, youngest team in the league, younger average age wise than any team in triple a all that sort of stuff and you guys just keep plowing along and as we speak you're in first place in the american league central with less than two months to go here basically six weeks left in the season what is the vibe like when you walk into the locker room every day it's incredible man it's it's such a good group everybody like it's not to be like cliche but like we like we show up to the field and it's like everyone missed each other from the night before Oh, yeah. I'm telling you, man, it's there's a lot of love. There's a lot of caring. Uh, and I think with as much youth as we have and inexperience, one of the one of the ways to overcome that and is well, really the only way to overcome it is to get everybody to feel like I belong. I'm a big leaguer. This is where I need to be. Like, I don't have to prove anything to myself, the organization or specifically my teammates. I felt like when I came up. I had a lot more to prove to my teammates than anyone else, because if you, if you have your teammates respect, then that's really all that matters. You want, you want to impress them. You want them to look at you as an equal. And the beauty of our organization is every person from front office to coaching staff to trainers, everyone looks at each other as equal, whether you have a cup of coffee or 15 years in the big leagues, whether you're not really any good, whether you're Jose Ramirez, everybody's like, no, I love you, man. And I know we're going to need you to go win a ball game today. That's really all that we care about. And we all, the way that we decided, like kind of in spring training, what our identity is going to be, um, is kind of what you're seeing on the field um, and how we play. And we knew that we're going to have to play the game a certain way to win ball games. And that if you look up, we're all saying, you know, if we look up at the end of September, the numbers are going to be there if we play the game this way. And you look at some of these guys' numbers and it is just, it's amazing. The, the Jimenez, the Gonzalez, the Rosarios, the Quans, so many guys that are just playing Cleveland Guardians baseball, while also as a byproduct, have these awesome, sexy, legit numbers that are going to get them paid. The, uh, there was a game the other day, and I forget who it was against, whether it was Detroit or somebody else, but there was a late game comeback, and there was a great shot. I don't know if you saw of Stephen Kwan. Uh, yeah, I guess it was a Jimenez homer off of Andrew Chapin. And he is jumping around like it is Little League all over again. dude. You don't get that sort of enthusiasm a lot at the major league level. I imagine for a guy who is, you know, 30 years old now and has been in the show for a while, it's kind of refreshing. I love it, man. I mean, <laughs> the, it's just, it's cool, man. It's, it's, it's something that you couldn't have expected that out of him in April or May. He's still being like looking around, looking over his shoulder. Like, is this real life? Like, 
I won rookie of the month. Like, is someone not going to try and come take my job now? Like, is this real? What's happening? And the kid has grown up so much and the confidence and uh, the leadership that I think that he has brung to the, to our team. Um, my goodness. He's a, he's a really, really special kid. And uh, just someone that, uh, that honestly, like he, he leads me, he, he brings me back, uh, yeah. back to reality when, you know, that's one of the hard things about being one of the older guys on the team. You don't necessarily have too many guys that, that can pick you up, uh, whether that's because they don't know if they should um, or they're, they're just worried about themselves because that's what happens in sports. Like when it all comes down to it, everyone's insecure because everyone thinks everyone's watching them and everyone thinks they suck when in reality, no, everyone's thinking about themselves and how much they suck. But with our team, Everyone's looking around and they're not, and it's, it's easy to notice when something's not going that well. There's been plenty of times this year where things aren't going that well for me. And Quan has been a really, really good one to uh, remind me of anything, whether it's even something I've told him and to be like, Hey, remember you told me this, like, I feel like this applies to you right now. I'm like, damn, man, that is just, that's it's, it's wisdom beyond his years. That's cool. I like to hear that. By the way, I don't want to have the show take credit for this, Robbie, did we ever get the numbers for Hedges and Maley since they appeared on the show together? Let me get them right now. Oh, you, oh you're getting them right now. Okay. But, you know, we talked about it when the two of you were together and you weren't hitting as well as you guys wanted. Uh, but we, you talked about how important it was for you guys to leave that part in the dugout because your job is to not only help the team, but help the guy out there on the mound navigate his way through an inning or whatever it may be, but you guys have hit the ball significantly better since you guys joined us together that one day. I don't know. It's been awesome. We, uh, I mean, him and I have, have been, have been working really, really hard all year. Um, and it, it just, it, it, ha it didn't really go so well for a while. And it's hard. I mean, this is a, this is a league of a bunch of dudes that can pitch. Um, but both of us continue to work. Um, we both have confidence in ourselves and in each other. And it has been so much fun to, to go out there and at least for myself, feel like I can go compete in the box and help the team win. And then when I'm not playing to go watch males absolutely tear it up. He had an absolutely huge clutch double yesterday coming in for mm -hmm. me. I, uh, it's, it's, it's been really, really fun to watch. He's an absolute joy uh, to work with on a daily basis. Um, so yeah, well, if it's you, sure. Then we need to keep doing more, maybe bring him back out because we're going to need some more hits in the playoffs. Yeah, I was going to say, to be honest with you, you kind of saved our part for last. Like, it was cute, you guys, your little love fest, and I'm rooting for him, and he's rooting for me, and wasn't going great. I didn't hear shit about Rose rotation of the last line. <laughs> I saved the best for last. Isn't that how it goes? Rob, you can stop looking up the numbers. They're obviously not important. Tell me how good I am, Robbie. <laughs> One homer, 224, 361 on base. For 361 on base? Since no, the kid's been the kid's been getting on base. That's been, that's just it, man. I'm like, I'm gonna walk, I'm gonna get hit by pitches, and I'm gonna put the ball in play. I'm not striking out. Ten walks, What's eight that? RBIs. Ten walks. Sick. One double. Not bad. Okay. It's been uh it's been good. All right. I like that. That's what we need to see. You gotta get on base. I think speed. that um I'm curious. Did Jose after his newly minted contract? We know that all the amazing jewelry he's got. Like the, my favorite one is the one of Jose wearing a necklace pictured inside of Jose wearing a necklace. Did, did he hand those out as like almost party favors to everybody? I wish, God, I wish he would. I think they gave him, I don't know if they gave him out to the crowd that day. I, think, I thought it was like oh, a crowd yeah. giveaway. Yeah, I wore the necklace that game. It was awesome. I had to, he loved it. Everybody that wore the necklace, he's like, yeah. Did you wear his necklace? I don't know. He lets Straw wear his necklaces sometimes. I don't know if you notice, like if you look at Straw's picture on the scoreboard, he's wearing Hosey's like thick gold chain in the team photo. And I mean, this thing is, this thing's heavier than he is. I don't even know how much it costs, but I thought it was so funny. Straw went around the whole picture day with Jose's massive gold chains on. I don't see you as an ice guy. No, but I oh see God. a lot of guys are doing it. I feel like I could... Look at him. Look at, Look at that big old thing. <laughs> I think Fran Mill must have left something after he went to Chicago. Uh, I, I'll i take it. I know that 
I think I can pull it off. I want to try it. Everyone's starting to do the, a lot of the guys are the, what is the, the black one? The, yeah. what is it? Black diamonds? Yeah. That that's what? been around for a while. That's it. I like that one. That one's cool. It's not as flashy. You can get something for, you know, maybe your wife buys it for you for your 30th or something. Don't we Or maybe, you know, it's just my birthday and I've gotten your show so many more followers that maybe you could buy me a present. Yeah. Well, don't worry. We're going to take care of a few things. Like maybe you're fine. <laughs> aren't even taken care of uh let's go that direction if you don't mind and i don't want us to get all serious because i think there's a lot of interesting components to this let's start with the the actual play at the plate uh from the other night where zach plesak is pitching you thought you got javi baez on the third out of the inning really weird play right ball hits the bag uh yeah we have to go get it freeman goes and gets it throws it home there you are. Your left knee is kind of in front of home plate. Let's start with what you were thinking at this time. Do you Are you cognizant of the fact that I can't put myself in front of home plate because of the rule? I'm very aware. I, uh, I take a lot of pride in that. That being said, 99% uh, of the times this happens, there's a play to the outfield, and you are getting there, and you get set up, and you have time to get set up. This play happens. I'm staying at home, and then within you know a second, there's being a play, you're seeing Javi around third and there's being a play that's going to happen at home plate. And I just got to go, the ball's already in the air. By the time I essentially go to cover home plate and realize it's happening, Freeman's already thrown the ball at me. And I'm like, I got to go get to my place. Uh, and where I like to go is about a foot or so in front of home plate to give that angle. And because that's just, it's, it's, what, it's what you work on for plays at home plate. You don't necessarily that specific type of play doesn't really happen that often um, where it happens so fast. Um, so um, it's something I, I know the technique to it. Um, I try and make sure I do that. So that play doesn't happen. The last thing you ever want is for an out at home play to turn into a run. It's about the most polar opposite of a, of a play that you can happen. So, uh, so yeah, so, so I thought I was going to try and do that. It just, it just happened real fast. Okay. Now you're in the dugout and Detroit is challenging the play. The announcement is made, and the look on your face, it was like they took your puppy away. Have you seen your look that you had? Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't what happy. Was going through your mind? Well, I was thinking, because I've been asked a lot of questions recently, because this play had been discussed multiple times now with, a, with it happening to other teams. Um, and when I was asked about it, I, I believe all my answers were that I thought these, these, these guys might have even blocked home plate. But when I, what I'm watching is these guys that are on top of the actual home plate with their shin guard, their knee over the actual plate. Um, so I'm thinking, okay, I mean, I'm about a foot and a half in front. Um, so I'm like, I don't think they should be able to call this. But then the longer it starts happening, I'm like, they're, they're going to find a way to do this. And uh, it, it it was less about even the call than we just got a, a cool play to end the top of the first inning. Um, and now there's a run in and now we got to go back out and pitch. Um, and it's a weird, like it, it's no wonder to me why some more runs scored that inning because it was just a, it was just a kick in the nuts. Really. It, it sucked. You're just like, dang man. And yeah, I'm feeling for my pitcher who just, who just got out of this inning and now he's got to go back and make more pitches. Um, it was, it was a lot of, a lot of inconveniences for, for us, uh, for, for really just the sake of trying to win a ball game. That's really what it comes down to. It's that's a run. We're now down one, nothing in the top. I don't want to give up a run in the top of the first. It's like the least, my least favorite inning to give up runs in. I want to get you out and then go score. And if you score first, the game, you kind of dictate the game. The game is, is there's such flow to our game where leads, ties, momentum, time of possession are really, really important. And they dictate how like males and I will even like call our game. If you have a lead, if you don't have a lead, it tells mm -hmm. you how aggressive, sure. how much you want to stretch the zone. Um, you know, do you want to just feed some guys some early fastballs? So try and get themselves out early to speed it up. Uh, it, it changes a lot. So I think that was probably all the stuff that's going through my head. So you end up giving up, Plesak ends up giving up a home run to Carpenter. Uh, you end up losing the game. We will get to your interview in a second. 
Was there a part of you that did not want to talk after the game? Yeah, of course. I wanted us to win the game and then just not have not feel like I needed to say anything. Um, but the way it all transpired, um, I just looked at my guy Plesak over in his locker, given his interview, and it just it really broke my heart. Um, as much for the team, as much for him, like that's how we are in this organization. Like, like we're all disappointed when we lose, but we're even more like we feel for the guy that you know didn't have a great game. Like, I want my guy to to throw a perfect game every time and go get paid two hundred billion dollars. And uh, I just, I, 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 that's like my biggest thing. Like, I can't see my guys hearts breaking. Okay, and that's what kind of got me. Uh, I am going to play a bit of your interview if you're okay with that, because I think it's important to kind of digest where we are as a sport with this play and where we should go and some other things here. So I'm not doing this to embarrass you. I think, I mean, you're good with it, right? Go ahead. All right, let's go. Well, first of all, it costs the game. Um, it's a play that's been called a few times now recently um, that really has never been called before. Uh, and for some reason, New York feels like they need to take over the game and change the way the game's played. Guys are just out. There's plays at home that are beating the runners. And for 150 years, you're out. It's to be able to take the game into their own hands that way. And to, first of all, that cost one run automatically. And then what ended up transitioning, uh, honestly, it's, it's a disgrace. It's embarrassing. Um, I think New York owes Zach Plesak specifically an apology. Um, okay, hold it they right there, the game Rob. out of his hands. Why'd you say that, the last part? I think basically what I just described, I think what I just described on, uh, on how, uh, on what, what the, what the real consequences were of that call other than just the loss, which is the most important one. Um, but, but for my guy, for, for my friend, my teammate, a guy that we're going to war with every day and I don't want to see him get runs. Um, and he has like the, the worst run support in major league baseball. Like the guy has, he throws the ball well every time we don't score for him. Like last year, he had three of our no hitters were with him pitching. Like things just don't go his way. And he works so hard to stay positive and to keep working and to be the great pitcher that he is for our organization. And I think I was just feeling really a lot for him. And, uh, and, and I think that was the main thing that I just, when, when, when the game gets changed a little bit, uh, there's some, there are some direct results and had that play not been called, nothing would have happened. It wouldn't have impacted anybody other than just the inning would have been over, but instead there was physical money taken out of Zach police police acts pocket. That's actual physical money. Those three runs are have a dollar sign in front of them and, uh, quite a few zeros, um, behind that dollar sign. Uh, and that, I think that's what, that's what really made that it hurt me a little bit. So I appreciate that a lot. Um, I like to be a problem solver. Okay. I don't like to just complain about stuff. I try to say, well, how can we make it better as a society? The rule was instituted when Buster Posey got lit up and was lost for a season. We can argue whether if it was just any other catcher, would the rule have been changed instead of a guy who was a, a star at that point? That's fine. The rule was there is there to protect you. Correct. Yes. Okay. I don't know if we can solve it. How do we change it? How do we change this? Because I don't think the old way is great when you're getting barreled over either, right? It's true. It's true. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I haven't put enough thought into it. Um, it's a tricky situation, though, when it, it – see, see, I don't know the answer because there's so many things that, um, that contradict each other. Like, yeah. I've had – I've been blown up at home plate in the big leagues post the rule. I've been hit and there's been no repercussions on the other end. So I'm not really sure what's to do um, because back in 2018, I believe I was ran over at home plate, knocked out of the entire circle and nothing happened. No fine, no suspension, no nothing on the person that did that um, and was not blocking home plate. The runner went out of his way to get me. And there was nothing that happened there from, uh, you know, uh, as a consequence. And, and yet there's a consequence if the, uh, if the catcher blocks home plate, which is a run. That's just the only thing that matters. Just 
a point on the scoreboard versus not. Um, I don't know. I feel like I feel like 99% of them, you're going to have guys rounding third from the outfield. So where I actually was, based off of if you watch what's happening, it, 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 it looks it makes it look a lot worse because Javi's running down the baseline. Right, okay. You don't run down the baseline when you're rounding third. Yeah, it's... So running down the baseline, that obstructs some home right there. But if he's rounding third, if you show the camera angle, there's going to be plenty of plate, and it's not even going to be a, a conversation. So that's that. I guess that would be something I'd be interested in is, was I blocking home plate only because that's where he's coming from? If he's rounding it, would that play have been called? I don't know. I just think there's a lot up for interpretation. Um, I appreciate the rule to keep the catchers safe because I actually used to get blown up all the time in the minor leagues before the rule, and that's not fun. I want to be healthy and safe, so I really appreciate the rule. Um, I just, you know, it just it 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 it's it's tough when when you feel like you try and and uh, and do it the right way, and then yeah. runs are run score. I like I don't know if we should have a bike lane. Like I don't know what the answer is, and it, it bothers me because. Here's what's going to happen. Like nobody gives a shit if it affects the Guardians in a one loss, what you know, in a game in the regular season. Nobody's going to give a shit if it happened to the Padres twice, which it did in a week span. You know when they're going to care? They're going to care when it happens in October to the Yankees or the Dodgers or the Braves or the Cardinals or one of these big time teams and it costs them a game or it costs them a series and then we're all talking, they're all talking about it on morning shows that don't talk about baseball at all because of this ridiculous rule. And right. then everybody's going to look at each other and say, well, we fucked this thing up, didn't we? So this is the thing. I want to try and get ahead of it so that it doesn't happen. And I wish I had a better answer because I don't. I, and, I, and I would love to, you know, hope, talk, with, talk with people in the league about, about making it just the, the more you can clarify things and make a clear, this is this, this is not it. If we can do that somehow, I'm all about that. Because I, uh, I want the game to be clean, safe, and, uh, and it makes sense where it's not up for interpretation so much with right. some things. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting because you can block every base, but home plate. And so it's interesting because with those ones, you just have to slide and you have to go through the leg or you have to go around the leg. Uh, I would, I would like to see maybe some consistency, uh, at all bases, um, where everyone knows this is, this is how you cover a base. Can you kind of block it? Can you not at all? Like let, let everyone know to work on it, Man, especially going into maybe in the spring training next year, it, every base should be the same because if you can't run over a catcher, there's really no difference of sliding into a blocked home plate as a sliding into second base when you're stealing a right. base and you got a leg blocking you there. There's still the same amount of injury on both sides. You got a guy sliding in head first who could break his fingers from the base uh, being blocked. You got the second baseman whose leg could get broken from somebody sliding in feet first and cleaning him in the leg. Also, I, it, it determines safe or out. There's, there's some weird things. I would like to look at the consistency of the whole thing. So anytime a play at a base has happened, it is consistent. So it's not these three bases. And then the only one that actually really matters, home plate, isn't something different where runs can be scored. Because if you're safe at second on a stolen base, no one cares because you're just at second you're still probably not going to score when you're safe at home. You're probably are going to score. <laughs> man. I mean, for a guy who did not go to college, you nailed it. You really did. You nailed it. Today's episode of the Rose rotation presented to you by our friends over at seat geek. All right. We still have about six weeks left in the baseball season. You want to go check out your team during the stretch drive. There's an easy way to do it. Pick up your phone, download the app, use the promo code ROSE, and then you get going. Now, it's not just for baseball games. The NFL season's around the corner. College football is back. The NBA is coming your way in October. We've got hockey. And, of course, concerts, they are year-round. Here's the great thing that SeatGeek does. They rate every ticket on a scale of 0 to 10 to make sure you are getting the best deal possible. They also color code it. So if you're looking on there and you see a ticket that's green, green, good, red, bad. Follow me again. Green, good, red, bad. 
And also, every ticket on SeatGeek is backed by their buyer guarantee so you can shop for tickets with confidence. And don't worry, we're going to hook you up as well. Use the code word ROSE. You get 20 bucks off your ticket at SeatGeek. That is $20 off your first purchase with the promo code ROSE. Make sure you click the link in the description to download the app. Once again, use the code ROSE for $20 off your first SeatGeek order. I'll see you at the games. You continued on afterward talking about you kind of went off on a different tangent. And I think a lot of people kind of woke up and were surprised because we so rarely hear it. And you say there are no repercussions for umpires. And we talked about it actually on the show, on our baseball today show, Ploof and I, and Ploof was like, he nailed it. We've said this for years. Umpires feel like tenured professors. It's one thing for a third baseman or an outfielder to say it. When you said it, were you like, oh my God, get those words back in here because you're a catcher. Yeah, it, 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 it's something that, you know, there's a lot of things that, that, that happen after games when you're, when you're trying to break down everything that happened, um, especially in a loss. And in losses, things get, get magnified and things, you got a lot, that's, there's a lot that you're feeling. Um, it was definitely not really my intent to um, go after umpires, really. I, I didn't, I have nothing but respect for the umpires. I love my relationship with the umpires. One of the things I look forward to each day is going back with the guys that have been back with me for years now. And it's, we, we hang out and we work together and we have a good time and we try and help each other uh, understand the zone and the feel of the game. Um, and so there were some things that happened in the game that were just, they were frustrating um, in how they were handled and then how they were handled after some decisions were made where sometimes I would just like to see um, some of those guys, um, you know, just be a little bit more approachable. Um, but really my problem with the whole thing was basically zero at the umpires. And I feel like it, it was only said because there were some things that happened along with the play in the first, but it all comes back to the play in the first inning. If the game, if we don't have three runs scored against us in the first inning, then there's no feelings of ill will towards the replay or the umpires. It kind of just set it all up and it just kept on happening. And it was one of those games where it just felt like everything was happening to us and against us. And so that's why I think something was said, but I would, you know, I, I wish I could have made it more clear that my problem was not with umpires, but was with more with the replay system in New York and how they handle things in their accountability. I think the umpires do get held accountable way more than they do. I think the umpires, they make bad calls or do things like they get, they can get their job taken away from them. They can get fined. And I've seen all that happen. Um, they do get scrutinized. You know, everybody wears out umpires. So I have a lot more respect for them, but it's really the people that are actually holding them accountable where there's less accountability. And it's the people making the actual decisions uh, up top that actually dictate wins and losses. When I would just like to see the players dictate wins and losses, um, the way that it was just the way it was. And if, if, if we did it the way that uh, I would have liked to do it, just the call that happened at home plate, the inning would have been over and everything would have been done and no comment would have been said. Even if all the other stuff with the umpires happened, no comment would have been said at all. I would have never done that. I've never done that. And uh, so it really all stems back down to that. Okay. Did you sleep okay that night or did, did things weigh on you? Everything between the game to the comments or were you, how long did it take you to kind of decompress? You know, I just, I, I went home. I talked, I talked it through with my wife uh, and I got nothing but support from my teammates, which is the only thing that matters to me. I got, if, if, if my teammates and my wife support me, then, I, you know, honestly, other people's opinions don't even matter. I got a, basically all support from, the rest of the organization and the team, which was made me even happier. Um, Cause when it comes down to it, that's the, that's really it. My teammates, my organization, that's giving me an opportunity uh, and my family respect what I did, then I'm going to live with it. And whatever happens because of it, I will live with it. But uh, if they're, if they know I got their back and they know that I'll go fight, fight with them and for them. Um, and honestly, like I, I slept well that night knowing that they appreciated it. Were there guys that texted you or just came up yeah. to you? Yeah. Yeah. I got, every, I got a lot of texts and then and a lot of kind words the next day from, from guys that we get, we go to war together every day. And, um, and, and we don't necessarily have too many guys on our team that, um, that, that 
are in a position to maybe do what I did. Um, Mm -hmm. And I felt like I'm, I'm in the position, um, especially in my career and kind of who I am as a ball player uh, to, to, to take a risk and to try and stand up for my guys. It's great. You have, a, I mean, you, you guys have had a ton of galvanizing moments this year. The, the issue up in New York where everybody runs out and helps Miles Straw and at the time Oscar Mercado and all that sort of stuff to this. I don't think it can do anything but help you guys. And I think it's always really interesting because I, I say this countless times on all the shows I do. I don't care what the fans say. I don't care what media says. I care what the guys in the clubhouse say about each other and think about each other. Which gets me to my next point. You played in San Diego with Fernando Tatis Jr. You were traded in the Clevenger deal. Clevenger came out and said afterward, this is the second time we've been disappointed in him. He's got to realize at some point it's not about him. How in the world can you ever repair a locker room when the biggest guy in there is taking shots from other dudes? It's tough. It's tough, but, um, but you have to, if they, if they want to win a championship and want to do something special, they have to, uh, they have a lot to overcome this year. Um, I think luckily for them, they have an enormous amount of talent. Um, and I know a lot of the staff guys over there, uh, you know, Bomel and, and Ruben Nieva, their pitching coach came from over here. Um, I know they got the guys to do it. So, um, it, it's, it's, I can't imagine having to overcome like something like that on our team. Um, you can do it. Um, but, but, but man, it is tough. And, um, the, I've, I've been a part of a few situations like that in my career and they're, 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 they're just difficult to overcome. Distractions are hard to overcome when you play a sport that you have to show up every day and look each other in the eye and, and really feel that, that mutual respect. Cause if you don't feel it, like you don't even need to say it, you feel it, you know it. And, um, you know, and, and, and all I can say on that is like, if I, like, I just can't imagine it um, on our team, it would, it would break some people's hearts. It would be really difficult because of how, how well everything flows and how everyone trusts each other and respects each other. Um, you know, decisions, selfish, deci- selfish decisions uh, really break groups of people down. Um, and so it's, t- it's tough to come back from, 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 from some of those decisions. I don't want to focus too much on it, but you did play with Tatis. When you heard the words that he's suspended, were you disappointed? Were you? I just broke it? my heart, man. It broke my heart. I love that kid. Uh, I mean, I was I played. I was playing against him in a rookie ball game, rehabbing the day he was traded to the Padres. I was playing against the White Sox, rehabbing uh, a hand injury. Uh, or something like that, and playing against him already, knowing who his dad was, then we trade for him. I'm like, man, I think this kid's this kid's all right. Like he's long, he's lanky, like he looks like he could be pretty good. And then watch him come up, and he's humble, and he's a good kid, and he's funny, and then he's just the best player ever. Like I felt like there was times where I was watching this kid play, and that's how I feel about watching Jose play here. Like I feel like I need to pay someone to be in the dugout for my seats because I get the best seat in the house to watch them play baseball. It's just they're jaw dropping, incredible ball players, and it just broke my heart. Just like the the wrist injury he had, because I just want to watch him play. I want to go on. I want to turn on MLB Network and watch Fernando Tatis highlights, or watch the Padres game, because that's why I want to watch play. So that's really what it comes down to. Like I know uh, I I enjoyed my time with him so much. Um, I, I hope I hope he can he can bounce back. I hope he's got enough support and. Um, you know, I really do believe time, time heals all wounds. Um, that doesn't mean it happens, you know, in a month or a year, even five years. But um, luckily for him, he's a young kid. And uh, look at what Pete Rose is doing, man. I mean, this guy's dedicated his entire life to trying to bring his name back and to be forgiven. So he's trying. So, uh, so you know, I think uh, Toddy has, a, has an opportunity to, um, I think, just become a, a new version start over. I think that part of his career now has to be dead. And now who's the new guy going to be. And if anybody can, can do it and become and remake themselves, one of the faces of baseball, it's him. And I really hope it is. I hope so too. I'm rooting for him, man. He, like I, I've got a son that's two years younger than him and kids in their twenties and people in their fifties, we all fuck up. 
It's like, what do we do with it? And I just hope that whether it was an accident taking it for this ringworm or not, sounds like a far-fetched story to me, but I don't, whether he did or he didn't, he let down a team, he let down an organization, he let down himself, he let down fans. Let... That's what, yeah. That it, and it is, it sucks. It really sucks. It was heartbreaking. We were in Toronto, I heard the news, and I literally like felt like my heart dropped because I, I was thinking I was going to go play against him. Talking about going back to San Diego, I, right. I was like, I cannot wait to go face this incredible ball club and specifically face Toddy again too, because it is so much fun to watch him play and then go compete against him. Um, so I was just, I was just sad. I was just sad. And, um, and I, and, and I hope, and I hope things turn around somehow. I hope so too, man. I hope so too. All right, let's do this uh, wheel of moderately interesting things and get you thinking about your trip home to San Diego, yeah. which will be nice. Uh, Robbie, let's see if we can get our little stranger things up there. I, you know, I hate to, fix the wheel of moderately interesting things, but why not? Let's just go for it today. You already know the category, so this is going to be good. There you go, Stranger Things. So, you get to answer. This is a category born out of the mind of Michelle Rose, my wonderful bride. She said, you got to ask people strange questions that make them a little uncomfortable. Okay. Uh, so this one, simply, what is the ugliest part of your body? There's a there's a, there is one answer. I have a I have a my left big toe toenail has been known to give some people some shivers. It has been I don't know if this is the proper like le, like diag like how a doctor would diagnose it, but what I remember I've had it my whole life. I was born with it, and the foot doctor we used to go to called it a traumatized toenail. And now my traumatized toenail. Which damn it has has been traumatized by all the by all my friends making fun of me every single day for how gross it is. Uh, it is it's a wow. it's like it's a shade of like a like a greenish yellow. Uh, it looks like a like a thick cornflake, like a green and yellow cornflake. <laughs> Which is why I always tell people, go ahead, keep laughing. Next time you eat cereal, you might accidentally find it in there. <laughs> but it it falls off and grows back the same every time. Every time, it, so it falls off literally about once a year, and then it just grows back green and ugly. And I'm like, what? One day, one day, it's gonna be okay. But yeah, I have this really weird ability. So if like this is the toe, so I have the ability to make this toe at all at all times cover the other toe so i'll just be sitting with my feet like this and i can just go and cover with my middle toe no pointer toe i don't know what that would be uh and i can cover the whole nail while i'm wearing like flip-flops or something or barefoot so no one can see it wow it sounds like you were traumatized as a kid and had to learn a specific skill yeah my mom used to be like no sweetie you're going to the beach today would you like to put a, a band-aid to cover your special toe <laughs> mom <laughs> mom it's not that bad <laughs> is it thick is it thick it's thick it's thick it's not it's not camera worthy i can't do that but next time i see you i will show you the special toe don't think so. I pass. No, you're gonna have to see it now. Hard pass. No, it's not up to you. Don't eat cereal around me. <laughs> oh my god! I knew we were gonna go in the wrong direction with this. You picked the question. Thanks, Michelle. That was awesome. That was a good question. Well, you know what? You should show it to her when you meet her on Tuesday. No, but I probably. But when I meet her, I'm gonna respect her. I don't respect you. What? That was a low blow. I felt so. You were hitting on my toe. No. Uh, I always appreciate the time. I want your hamstring to feel better. Let's get a little treatment on that bad boy. Make sure. Ankle. It's... Oh, your ankle. Yeah. It's not your hamstring. That's other people I know. My muscles are too strong. So, yeah, that's what. My I bones know. are weak. Or maybe milk. Is your, is your ankle black and blue? That's not bad. That's not bad. I'm going to try and play today. Ooh. We'll see. All right. Tough guy. I like that. And, and I really do appreciate you kind of taking us through because there's some people who would have just said, hey, listen, Chris, I said what I said. But I think it's important kind of for the for the people that listen, understand where you're coming from as a catcher, 
where we might be going with the sport and the rule and why you were so ticked off. Yeah. I hope, I hope people understand that it's, there's, there's no really like ill will behind it. It's just a, no. it's just my, from my point of view. That's it. That's all it ever is. I'll see you in San Diego. Travel safe. Enjoy your off day on Monday. What are we doing? Dinner at the house. Dogs, family. We're going to be, yeah, it's going to be a good one. Oh, you're so excited. Look at you. And then it's like a six-week sprint to the finish, man. That's right. Well, it's already started. That sprint has already started. I'm limping my way right now. <laughs> so we'll see you in the middle of a middle of the way through September, you and your nasty cornflake nail. Yes. For our amazing producer, the one and only Robbie Scirocco, for the toenail king, Austin Hedges, I am Chris Rose. We will see you next time on the Chris Rose Rotation, a production of John Boy Media. Hey, quick reminder, baseball today, Monday through Friday, is on the Amazon AMP. Comes your way live, 11.30 a.m. Eastern. I'll be joined by Trevor Plouffe, where we break down the biggest stories of the day and what happened the night before. Now on AMP, you can actually be part of the show. We'll be taking live callers. We want your opinions. So join us live on the AMP app. Download it today on your iPhone. Use the code BASEBALL today to tune in.